Chit Chat is sponsored by Fun Again Games, where everyone is welcome at our table. And your source for hard-to-find imports, liquidation games, new releases, and much more. Be sure to visit funagain.com to check it out. It's episode 90 of Chit Chat, and we're talking all about themes in games. Some have been problematic to say the least, while newer games have learned to build their own themes from scratch. And others might look familiar, but they're just so darn cute. Welcome back to Chit Chat. This is episode 90. We are just 10 away from Big 100, and we'll come up with something cool to do for sure episode 100. But episode 90 is all about themes in board games. We're going to talk a little bit maybe about themes we like, maybe some themes we don't like. But we're going to talk about themes in a different way, too. Maybe some overused themes, sure. at least in our opinion. None of those, right? Uh, <laughs> and the, uh, the whole idea that I think we're seeing more and more games that are kind of absent of traditional themes, yeah. like historic mm -hmm. themes, for a variety of reasons. So before we talk about themes to death and the games we've been playing, Ryan, we have a winner, if you can remember the name. We do. Congratulations. Last week we gave away the game Quest, and that is going to Jim Grant. Thank you, Jim, for commenting. You all have won. So please email us at gmail.com so we can get your prize out for you. And this week we're giving away Wingspan because that is a direct tie-in to what I'm about to talk about. Yeah, but what you're about to talk about? Well, we're all about to talk about. Well, we're about. all about to talk <laughs> about. What I'm about to talk about specifically right now. Yeah, because I do think Wingspan was kind of a refreshing theme at the time. And now maybe... Everyone's yes. kind of jumping on, well, not just birds, but birds and trees. We see these like tentpole games. Like I remember when Dead of Winter came out yeah. and everyone was like, oh, a zombie board game. Like that was cool. And then everyone was zombies. There was zombie board games. Well, they kind of hit around the same over. time. Like Zombicide is around the same we time. We had like Zombicide and like, you know, we just were so obsessed with zombies as a culture for some reason. For sure. Like Walking Dead and all that. And then Wingspan, yes, was fantastic. And it still is a great game. Great theme, great components, great artwork. It looks beautiful. But it seems like every month we have a new like nature or animal themed game. It definitely kicked off the nature uh, craze in mm -hmm. board games. Because uh, I, I think in just in the last several months, I mean, we here on the channel have covered games that are about plants, uh, plant games about animals. We've got Ark Nova back here. Bird watching. Uh, mm -hmm. Bird watching. Yeah, I, yeah. Did, I just did one for bird watching. Mm -hmm. And I have to say, I kind of like it. And you were saying. I love it. Animals yeah. is my favorite theme, honestly. And I think it's an untapped market. Well, it was before, right? Because <laughs> I love it. It's just, it's fun to see animals. They can be cute and cuddly, but they can also be like more ferocious if it's kind of like a battley kind of game. I think it has a lot of place to go without getting into more sensitive things. Yeah. Um, so there's a lot of leeway with what you can do with it and a lot of different things that haven't been done mm -hmm. or explored there. Yeah, I think, and I'd, we'd mentioned this, Ryan and I, uh, we haven't posted it yet, but our Arc Nova video that we did, we talked about, or I talked about anyway, some of the animals you see in that game mm -hmm. have a definite impact on my play anyway. So I drew three cards, and you have to draw three cards and discard one, potentially. And one of the three cards was this dusky leaf monkey that was absolutely adorable. <laughs> and I hadn't looked at even the mechanics. And I was like, I showed it to Ryan even, even though I was playing against him. And I said, how can I get rid of this guy? It's too cute. Uh, interestingly enough, and I said this in the video too, later in the game there's a mechanic where you can release an animal into the wild. So okay. I, I let the dusky leaf monkey go. Uh, but this is a, an example of where theme really had an impact on my experience with the game, for yes. sure. Like, I will never forget that story, mm -hmm. and I'll probably tell people about sure. that every time we're talking about Ark Nova, for sure. Well, I think, yeah, it's not going anywhere, this nature thing. Mm -hmm. No. I mean, we're seeing more and more games that are coming out. We've got a couple, not only Ark Nova, but Savannah Park. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We had Renature, which came, which we played on our last uh, marathon last year for Essen. Mm -hmm. Games like Parks. and Ecos. Ecos. Park, yeah, like, trail, yeah. I mean, in a lot of ways, these things are good, and I think you really can't go wrong with a nature or animal theme. I think right. kind of what you were pointing at and what you briefly mentioned was people getting away from those historical themes because yeah. historical themes come with a lot of baggage. And yes, there's some elements where, you know, these animals, especially if they have human characteristics, can be called out for analogs of different whatever. Sure. Sure, there's still room for problems, but I haven't really seen it so much within these themes. Like within these 
animal games. Well, no, sure. I mean, I think it is safe to say that it's a little safer theme to venture into. Um, and it's probably a wise thing to do, but not only animals and nature, but we're starting to see things that are just kind of like somewhat themeless. Boone Lake, uh, which we've played a ton now, doesn't really have a traditional theme. I mean, sure. I think we can all agree a lot of Euros sometimes have themes tacked onto them right. anyway. Sure. But this one, they've definitely leaned into this being just kind of a fictional world. Like we were looking at the, the graphic design on it has some weird technical aspect yeah. to it, yeah. yet it seems Old West at the same time, so it also seems a little steampunky, but they don't really lean in too hard to any one of those things, right. so it's kind of like a very vague, fictional yeah. situation or setting, if you will, but it really, the game mechanics come first, and the theme is certainly secondary. Yeah, I think well, I read the the top part, the setting, <laughs> like three different times just to try to get clues of like, what does this mean? How does it all go together? But really, I think you're right. They just leaned into this themeless thing of like, you're in a new place, you're exploring, you're yeah. building stuff, and it's you, that's like, all you need to know. And I think that, you know, Alexander Fisher himself, like, he was in a little bit of a hot water for the game Archive, which I love that sure. game. But that game does have you kind of colonizing, which is yeah. kind of a theme that people are absolutely strongly critiquing these days right, fairly. So. I think even a game like Maracaibo, if they had just, if that had been not Maracaibo, but if that had been Boone Lake, if that had been in the same universe as Boone Lake, a completely yeah. fictional right. universe where you're putting little colonies on uninhabited islands, mm -hmm. all of your controversy goes away mm -hmm. in a second and your game is still just as good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think... Uh, there's a sort of changing of the guard, I think, in the gaming community, right? A lot of old games, I mean, a lot of board games historically have been about, you know, historical conflicts or mm -hmm. things like that. That's because the board gaming demographic used to be people who really got into those sorts of things. Sure. And as time has gone on, that's less important by far. I mean, one of the more interesting games I played also recently is Bitoku. And Bitoku... I, I, I don't know. I'm not even sure what I the theme is. It's very foresty in nature, but it's very fanciful and mm -hmm. fantasy based. So it's not exactly and it, that could probably be anything. Also, you could come up with anything to to build around that. The theme is kind of this safe space that no one can really argue with. Right. Well, because it's fantasy. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. And, you know, there's pitfalls, of course, but like fantasy and science fiction as well. There's There's a reason I'm drawn to science fiction. We Kind of laugh about it. Everyone's already <laughs> laughing at me because I really do like space games. But part of the thing about space <laughs> games, like games like Unsettled and Terraforming Mars, it lets you do themes or, or mechanics of, around settling and colonization without it being like actually about colonization, right? Like Terraforming sure. Mars, you're literally well, colonizing. It's a barren planet. It's so. a barren <laughs> planet, right? Mm -hmm. And it's sci-fi. It's in the future. I mean, On Mars from Lacerda is another... Great example of that. Like it, it hits all those same buttons. You don't need to have a theme that involves like colony, colonizing native lands. Sure. Like we don't we don't need that to have good game mechanics and fun games. Mm -hmm. Now I will say, have you played Messina yet? I've not. Okay. No. So Messina is the sort of one outlier here that would it is historic, mm -hmm. and I found it interesting. In most cases, though, I don't find the historical conflict setting for games terribly personally terribly interesting okay yeah like i just uh, it doesn't do much for me mm -hmm. i'm not into like you know war reenactments or anything yeah, but like i thought that. you were loving those coin games i mean i do like that but i like them for the mechanics sure sure right um that is an interesting uh, an interesting call out um but the the conflicts not so much messina was interesting just because it was like sort of eye-opening to understand that i didn't i knew about the game but i didn't know what happened in Messina in 1347 mm -hmm. right. until I played the game. So I actually kind of felt somewhat educated by it, which was kind of cool. But other than that, I traditionally see a game that has a place name and a date, and it's not usually for me. It's definitely not no, for you, right? No. Plus, I'm not even going to remember the name. I have such a hard time <laughs> with dates. History was not my best subject. <laughs> so you like tell me, and I'm like, oh, great. I'm just going to put it in my VGG right now so that I remember because I'm not going to remember what this is even called. That's hilarious. Uh, Christina from Blue Peg Pink Peg, one of her pet peeves 
she doesn't like games that have a date in it. Like yeah. she just <laughs> no eighteen XX games for her. She doesn't like she doesn't like dates and she doesn't like wizards. Like she has a short list of things. <laughs> yeah, it's a weird list. But like if there was a game about wizards that was set in a historic yeah. time period, that would be off the table. You know, when you were talking about historical games, I don't think just the very nature of a historical game is a problem. We've seen some really great historical games. Sure. You've seen as one Praga, which came out from Suhi last mm-hmm. year. Uh, even like Crystal Palace from Capstone, which is set in this very specific time. And one that I really enjoyed was that City of Big Shoulders, mm-hmm. which these are all games that take place in a very specific time in history where the theme and the mechanics are very intertwined to tell that particular story. And I think you can do that. You just need to stay away from problematic times in history. There are certain times of history that we don't need to relive in our board games, right? Like, Themes don't always have to be fun. They can be educational at the same time, which I found Crystal Palace and, like you were saying, Messina quite educational. Mm -hmm. I think it's just a matter of having just a little bit of, like, respect for the source material. Yeah, respect is the key thing there because I think some games can even include some of those issues but do so with the right attitude and the right amount of respect towards them to where it's not just like, oh, yeah, this is a game about us coming in and taking over mm-hmm. this land. Right. Um, there's a lot of games now that are kind of showing the flip side of that. Yes. To, uh, which which is, I think, a good way and, a, and actually a really good way to help people who are playing games look at it from that different perspective as well. As silly as it sounds, we're talking about board games, but I do think, just like I learned about Messina 1347, I think someone can play a game like that and kind of go, oh, this see it from a different uh, perspective. I there. was thinking of Spirit Island when you said exactly. that too, right? Because you have the island revolting against the colonizers who are coming in, and I thought that was super cool when I heard about it. I was like, oh, this is awesome. This is like the flip of what all these normal games are like and just doing the opposite, and it's a co-op. I, I loved it. Mm-hmm. For sure. Now, we'll talk about get themes that we do like. You said you like nature. I love nature animals, yeah, or animals. Animals and nature. I mean, animals, I, I really go for the cutesy stuff. So, like, Meadow when we play. Right, yeah, yeah I was going to say, you really did like Meadow. I do. I love it so Did you much. end up going and getting it after we played it? I have not yet, but it's not on the list. list. Yes. It's on the list. I'm, Christmas on the list. is coming up. Family members <laughs> watching. Secret Santa out there. You know what she wants. Yeah. Um, for me, and we were talking a little bit about this before we started recording, it's not any specific theme. It is a unique themes, like different themes. Like I mentioned Butoku earlier. Things that I just haven't seen before. Mm-hmm. Uh, another one that we played at Gen Con and we really loved, Resurgence. Uh, yeah. It has a unique thing. It's post-apocalyptic, but it's post-apocalyptic Russia. And it's done in a very Fallout-y sort of way, if you're familiar with the Fallout franchise. And it is a really good meaty medium Euro. Yeah. which is also kind of cool when you see a unique theme. You know, so Euros are traditionally, you know, spice trading or farming. Spice trading. You know, <laughs> right. in, in, farming. A, in a historic sense. And even still today, they don't really stray out too far yeah. uh, often from that. But things like Butoku and Resurgence and some of the other things we're seeing, those are very different sort of things. And that is what helps me get into a game mm-hmm. is because like, oh, this is cool. Rococo is another one which is about you know, like being a tailor and making dresses and that sort of stuff. That was a theme I thought when I first heard, like, what? And it's a great game. Mm-hmm. And now I kind of dig the fact that they were bold enough to choose a weird theme like that. Yeah, I mean, I think for me, I will joke about the space thing, sure. I do like science fiction. I do like space. But I like when Euro games come with themes because traditionally they didn't. Yeah. yeah. And I think part of the reason that I'm drawn to, like, Alexander Pfister as a designer is because all of his games have felt so thematic and even though boone lake the theme could have been anything but the idea of exploring this lake and all these different actions that you can take they all feel thematic to what you're doing they make sense they they all yeah they all make sense and even if it's a farming game sure i don't mind playing a a farming game for you know a a couple hours or a trading game i think we're going to get to a point where we start to miss the farming and the trading games because People are exploring all these different new themes. Maybe farming in post-apocalyptic Russia. There you go. I would play, so I, I'm a sucker for post-apocalyptic games too. So I would play. I don't know if I've seen that theme yet. What I just said. Post-apocalyptic, yeah, like like <laughs> Uwe Rosenberg's new game is like set in the post-apocalypse, and you have to try to regrow all the the crops. It would be really really strange to see something like that, but I, I'm sure we will. We'll see some crazy stuff come yeah. along well, on I themes. Think People are getting more experimental with their themes, yeah. which I like. And I think board games are growing as a hobby. 
they're reaching people in different places than they used to. And those people come in with different interests. I mean, who would have thought that games about bees would be as popular? Well, we've had yeah. like, yeah, well, we, true. we've had, and what's funny about like, I'm going to use this bee theme as an example is we've had games like honey buzz and bees. And then there's, there's been like such a variety of the, the, the depth of those games, mm-hmm. right? Some of them are like hardcore simulation games about a beehive. And others are like a cute, fun game about making honey, oh, yeah. right? Well, even there's a game called Bees with yeah, like that's lots all of the, Z's. All the Z's. Yeah, and that's a fast. That that's more what you'd expect from a game with that theme and name traditionally, because it's fast-paced, fun, very light, family weight game. But yeah, like you said, yeah, there's, there's a some... bee game for everybody, no matter what kind of game you like. <laughs> which I mean, which is quite kind of crazy. Ten years ago, that never would have been the case. Yeah. No, I'm, that's true. I'm thinking about the baking game that you and Alicia played. Um, oh, Kim Joy's Magic Bakery? Yes. I love to bake, so I would love seeing more baking themes, honestly, in board games. And... Well, and that's an interesting use of IP, too, right? Because yeah. traditionally, IP uh, for anything, including board games, you'd look for a big IP, mm-hmm. you know, something that was hugely popular. And not that Kim Joy isn't. It's got its own sect, but it it's... Uh, a unique enough theme to where you're reaching out to a group of people who might not be traditional board gamers who like uh, enjoy the Great British Bake Off, which, by the way, I have been watching. Do you watch that? Does I do. I love it. That? Yeah, that is a, it is a pretty good show. We're not. I promise, we're not going to turn this whole episode into talking about it. That's next episode. That is next episode. <laughs> uh, maybe, maybe episode 100. <laughs> maybe. Uh, but some of the themes. What was the other one that I wanted to mention here? Oh, mind management. So when we're talking about IP, uh, one of the things we're starting to see is people using kind of unique IP. Not right. like it's not Star Wars. It's not some giant IP. Not Walking Harry Dead. Potter, it's yeah. everyone. Oh, right. like oh, Harry that's Potter, got a yeah. massive amount of fans. Mind management is probably what you would regard as a niche niche it's comic. An indie comic. Indie mm-hmm. comic. And I, I think what's great about something like mind management is what that did is it, it advertised something to comic book fans. They were fans of this indie comic yeah, game. Maybe they didn't play board games. And also getting board gamers into indie comics. Like yeah, it, it the crossover. Does, they, yeah, and that crossover is huge. And I think we're going to see more and more of that. We're, we already are seeing it with, with uh, companies that are going through these small comic book series or these small novel series like Red Rising. Like mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I don't know yeah. how popular Red Rising was as a novel. I had never even heard of it until the board game came out, but then I immediately went and I read all the Red Rising novels. You know, that is an interesting point. I think that happened with Red Rising quite a bit because I I saw a lot of uh, content on YouTube about Red Rising and almost everyone was saying what you just said. Like, I'd never heard of the novels. Or some people were saying, I loved the novels and when I heard this game was coming out, I had... And I was fascinated because a lot of those people would talk about the game... And relate it back to their knowledge of the characters mm-hmm. and how they are connected. That's the best part about that. Yes. And yeah, for sure. <laughs> that those those relationships are woven into the cards very mm-hmm. well, and that is a key. And the same thing goes with mind management. They did a really good job. I don't think it's a, a case where there's a game with a mechanism that doesn't have anything to do with mind management. I think those married up pretty well. Well, in, yeah, in that I, game. I think this is a whole another topic. But we were talking about treating your source material with respect, I think that goes yeah. for IPs yeah. as well. Yeah. I don't want to play an IP that has nothing to do with it. Like, for example, Dune Imperium, which is a game that I think we both really enjoyed. I don't know if you've played Dune. Yeah, I love it. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Like, that feels like Dune without trying to replicate the IP on a one-to-one basis, right? right. It's, it's this abstract worker placement deck building game that just happens to take place in the Dune universe, but it still feels... Like Dune, it feels like they had great respect for the source I would material. I agree with that wholeheartedly. I think that's a great example of where theme is there, but it's not a... Te- like they it's did not a, heavy-handed. It's not right. heavy-handed, and the game just feels like a great game set in that universe yes. as opposed yeah. to a game that tries to replicate the storyline or anything like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, but if you're looking at IPs versus just themes in general, that is a, uh, its own whole bag of worms <laughs> to try to unravel. I think we've talked a lot about IPs on Chit Chat in the past. Yeah. And, you know, and sometimes IP games are great, and lately they've been great. But I think following these trends of, like, what themes are popular, it's super interesting to me mm-hmm. to try to guess maybe what the next big one's going to be. I don't know. It's hard to know. It's hard to think of a category. Obviously, like we were talking about nature and animals, it's so massive. And one of the things yes. we didn't touch on is it's so relatable. Mm-hmm. Like, Everyone knows animals sure. right. and nature. Yeah. Like we, it's all around us. So that's the other reason I think something like that hits. 
but it also doesn't hit unless there's a big game that does really well. That breaks out. And, like, yeah. and, and, you know, that, Back to that Wingspan, was, the first one we talked yeah. about. Yeah, yeah, exactly, like Wingspan. I which, mean, Wingspan was not the first bird game or the first animal game, but it, sure. like, I mean, it might have been the first bird game. I mean, I, I remember when it first was announced, I was no, there, like, there's birds? Old, well, there's some older, older bird games, but yeah, it was definitely a theme that laid dormant for a long time. Yeah. <laughs> for sure but I, I mean props to wingspan right i mean they for sure like they didn't grab the hottest theme right like they found a theme that fit the mechanics i don't know if they pitched the game as birds or if birds were added like i don't know what part part of the design process it became <laughs> a bird game but it was a brilliant that decision. would be an interesting story to it find out whether or not sure. that was pitched as something completely different first you know, i mean it sometimes it happens yeah <laughs> Yeah, because the bird idea person is the real winner there. Right. <laughs> the bird idea person. I mean, it might have, a lot of times games keep the theme they're pitched with, but sometimes publishers decide to change the theme or Do retheme it or put different artwork on it. Yeah, or it'll probably be something just like every other piece of entertainment. You know, things kind of, there's an ebb and flow of like what gets hot. Yeah. I mean, another one we haven't talked about, dinosaurs or an, yep. another dinosaurs. giant yeah, and, theme. And dinosaurs is one that like keeps kind of threatening to like, blow up i mean we'll i mean get it's like blown two or three. up pretty well there's been a lot lately it is and it's kind of hard to for me to pull dinosaurs away from animals like i think it is different it though, is honestly. different but it's also part of the same whole thing but it's not just dinosaurs it's a lot of like dinosaur parks yep sure well like that's yeah. a, which is a very specific because everyone wants to do specific. jurassic park without doing the license right, right. <laughs> Even if it was a licensed jurassic park game that came sure. out i haven't yeah. played it yet mondo did one but like just regular dinosaurs whatever yeah. it's all about building those dinosaur parks which i'm guilty of i mean we just played dinosaur uh, world and i have the dinosaur world raw and right which i haven't actually played mm -hmm. yet i'm dying to get that to the table so mm -hmm. whatever i'm guilty i think the next big wave regardless is going to continue to be a lot of unique efforts on the on the theming front i, I think that's so. what we're going to see for a while is just like for lack of a better way of putting it weird themes unusual i themes. want that i really yeah. want it yeah well yeah and i want to see personally is publishers investing in their own worlds that's why i really like what skybound did like with title blades where they had this great universe they created they're setting a bunch of different games in that title blades universe and i'd like to see boone lake i think that whatever world they're creating there is just ripe for games to come out sure. red raven does this with a lot of their games taking place for in the sure same universe and i and i like that I, I like coming back to the same world but like different areas or different aspects mm -hmm. of yeah that. there's a level of comfort there and this is i don't know if this would fall into the category of theme but i think garfield games does a lot of that too there's a, a common thread there with the artwork and they come out with their trilogies so you know that they're going to have this yeah. game and this game and this game and they're all kind of set in that same yeah. universe in fact they just announced a they new did one, the right? south tiger series yeah, yeah. so that's going to be interesting to see I, I mean we love i mean i can't think of one of those garfield games that we don't no, like. I've, I've liked all have of them. Have you played a lot of the Garfield? I have not, no. Well, oh, and, they, wow. and they didn't just do it with that. Their Circadian series yep. as well. They just launched a new Circadians game. Completely different game, but set in that same Circadians world. With the same artwork, or similar, yeah, artwork, similar artwork and things artwork. like that. So they do a really good job of bringing those things together. I think together it's great. And, and you, only have to, you only have to do it all once, right? You come up with all right. the, the, the world, and then you just pick and choose different areas of that world to set your game in. I think it's nice for players, too, because there's some kind of familiarity, you exactly. know, when you're coming into it. You're like, oh, yeah, just like this game that I got to play. And you, you want to play the yeah. next one. Yeah, I And think... it's there, too, that, that it's the look of it's familiar. But then when you play it, you also have a different experience, even though it's different. It has a familiarity to it that pushes some of the same buttons as some of their other games. Yeah, I mean, too. the West Kingdom trilogy, I think, was had the best of that. So anyway, we've talked enough about theme, uh, although I'm sure theme. we'll talk more about it at some point, maybe even this episode. We'll finish off by talking about a little about, anyway, the games we've been playing. Because we've been putting up a fair amount of content lately. That's true. A lot of what we've been playing is the content that we have been putting <laughs> up. Uh, who wants to start? Um, I'll start. Yeah. So, okay. of course, we you'll, you'll see some of this stuff up. But we got to play Boone Lake, which I was really excited about. Mm -hmm. We got to play Arc Nova, which I was really excited about. I mean, those were two games that I've been waiting for uh, for a really long time. Those were two so, big Essen games that i was very much looking forward to yeah, playing I mean, they and were they were like my top two things um once i started hearing about arc nova and just hearing the similarities to terraforming mars and the different unique card play um that was two great essen games and we played 
We played a Destiny game. What was that roll and write we played? We played Riverside. Riverside, yeah. We, say, oh, how was Riverside? We that loved was, it. It was yeah. a lot of fun. Yeah. We played it twice already because we, yeah, we played did. it one week and then we were like, bring it out again. Come on, Riverside. Yeah, River, I mean, it's, it's simple. It's a simple little roll and write, but it's it's super fun. I mean, I figured you were probably going to talk about that I one. I was going to so. talk about it, so thanks for stealing I didn't want to steal your mine, thunder, but, <laughs> but I, I, I'm glad to be getting some of these Essen games to the table. So tell us about Riverside. So Riverside, like you said, it's a roll and write, um, but I think what was cool about it is you're rolling the dice. It has this component of hot or cold and what's powering your engine. You're on... You're on a little steamboat, right, doing a cruise around the Arctic, um, and you get to do the little excursions. Um, but because you roll the dice, this heat element decides, like, which dice you can take without a penalty. Yeah. So you're really trying to figure out, like, do I want to go for the bigger numbers now but take a penalty on the heat, or do I want to go for smaller numbers and not really get my engine going as much? Um, what I like about it is that it has a board, right, where you're the, the same ship is going around the Arctic and we're all doing these excursions together. So even though it's a roll, uh, a roll and write where they can feel very separate, you know, like Ryan's doing yeah. his own thing, mm-hmm. I'm doing my own thing, it still felt like we had this element of tying us all together, right? Like on your train, you could be like, I'm going to see the reindeer, I'm going to the polar bear, and you're like, cool, we're, we're all going to the going same to the ish places. You could go to the breweries. Yes. Right? And, and those, it's cool. The excursions are how you score points. And you're like selling tickets basically for these excursions to people on your boat. Oh. And there's this whole multiplier of like the tickets times the yes. number of the excursion. But it's it's a puzzle because every time you stop at an excursion, you have to score more points than you did last time. Mm-hmm. So you kind of have to try to time it. It's really Plus, unique. Plus, you have to try to get, you get points too for your lowest scoring track, like color. Yeah. Um, so you're also trying to balance between like, you don't want to have one that's just huge and one that's nothing because that nothing is going to really penalize you later. Um, so yeah, there's a lot that go- is going into it, but you still feel tied together because you're on the same board and you're doing the same things, um, but you can end up with wildly, wildly different, different results. <laughs> well, and speaking of rolling rights, we played a flip and right too. We played Demeter yes. the other day oh. as well, which is- I've not even heard of that. Again, this is- so this is di- it's dinosaurs in space. Yes. The idea yeah. is that there you, it is. We were it's starting... the same world as Ganymede. Too. It is the same world. It's set in the same world as Ganymede, oh. which was a big board game that came out a few years ago. And you're observing this world that is a lot like Earth, that is in its level of development where it has dinosaurs. But you're studying them, so you're kind of like sending people down to study the dinosaurs. And it's a flipping right. You have all these decks of cards. Each deck is like a different type of technology mm-hmm. or a different area of the board that you can research. It's Pretty neat. I loved the theme on that one for sure. Um, and then it had the sequel, Varuna. Yeah, um, I haven't played that. You but that was, it. yeah, it's it's very similar. It does a little bit of changes on the mechanics. Some of them I really liked, and some of them I would still go back to Demeter sometimes. Um, I think there's different enough games, but Varuna, its theme instead is you're underwater, discovering these new, like, like. What do they call them? Reptiles Reptile. that look like dinosaurs. <laughs> yes. <laughs> the French to English translation is interesting. Oh, I see. Um, but, uh, but it's a good game, too. And I thought they did just enough different that it, it did play differently. Um, but again, one of those themes that was all, all in the same universe, I yeah, should say. Yeah, I, I like that. Ganymede. Both Flippin' Rights? Both flippin the Flippin' Rights and Ganymede are all in the same universe oh, okay. that they created. Which I, I, I love that. Yeah. Those sound like more robust riff Flippin' Rights or Rollin' Rights. We play, well, you played this with me, Trek, Trek 12. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So Trek 12 is a pretty straightforward roll and write, but one that I thought for as simple as it is, offered a lot of real thinky, puzzly things that you're doing. Mm -hmm. This isn't a thing where you're triggering combos. This is not that kind of uh, roll and write. This is one where you're trying to uh, work within a puzzle that's going on in front of you. You're basically rolling two dice Uh, You're doing that enough so that all the players fill in every circle on their mountain. Mm -hmm. You're effectively, the theme is like you're climbing mountains and things like that or ascending or or descending from mountains. You write a number. You roll the dice again. You're going to write other numbers, but they have to grow out from that number. The trick is the two dice is whenever you roll them and take a number, you can take the highest number. You can take the lowest number. You can subtract the lowest from the highest, or you can add them two together, or you can multiply them. Plus any given circle can't have higher than 12. So, and you can only use any of those powers I just listed four times each. So you start to run Mm -hmm. out of things. So if you've used all your pluses, there are certain numbers that are going to become extraordinarily difficult to get from this Mm -hmm. point forward. If you want a seven and you don't have any pluses, you're dead (laughs) in the water. You're never multiplying that. You're not, or subtracting with these six-sided dice. So one of the dice is zero to five, one of them is one to six. 
Um, so it, you have to really kind of get to understand that. The cool thing about the game is you can play it just like that. One sheet, do it, score it up, and win. Um, but the cool thing is you can play expedition mode, which you take three mountains, and you're going to play them one after the other. And then this brings in these assistant cards or assist cards that let you break some of the rules. And you can get those assist cards by at any time if you ever put uh, like a zero next to a zero or a one next to a one or a two next to a two, you're able to take an assist card and it's going to let you break a rule. And then on top of that, there are these envelopes that have these um, sort of achievements to do. part. <laughs> so that has a picture of like, oh, if we play this round, there's an envelope here that has five circles that are all shaded, meaning that they all have the same number in them. Mm -hmm. So if any one player were to do that during the session, then you're all able to open that envelope. And those envelopes, I've peeked, by the way. <laughs> those envelopes include like completely new rules, new assistant cards. Oh, cool. Some of them include, and I hopefully, I'm going to put a spoiler alert spoiler on alert. this. Some of them include new characters that you can play against in solo mode. Oh, interesting. Ooh. So like with slightly different solo personalities yeah. and rule sets. And some of them include completely new mountains, so like a whole pack of sheets. Oh, wow. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, and the mountains as you progress become more challenging because like some of the circles are dark, so you can only put up to six in those. Mm -hmm. um, and then some, I didn't explain exactly how you score, but you're basically either doing the same number next to each other for groups to areas, mm -hmm. or you're connecting like zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. It, continuous. Uh, yeah. Continuous. So it becomes very puzzly, yes. and you're going to have some circles that end up being losers at the end. I want to play that expedition mode. Yeah, we'll have to try it as a group. They also have it on BGA, and oh, it's cool. a really nice. good implementation. I played it last night about eight times in wow. a row on BGA. So I you it. like the game. I think it's <laughs> I did. To say. I, lo I love the look of it. It's from Bruno Catala, who's one of my favorite designers. And I, I, I don't know that he's ever done another like roll and write type game I that I know so. of. Not that I know of either. So that's what a, a drew me to it. But I really, really enjoyed it. And then the other game, and this is the only other game I'm, I have, so <laughs> get ready with yours, uh, is Jekyll versus Hyde. I learned about this game just two days ago. Uh, I was talking to the publisher, and they mentioned it, and I had not heard of it. This is a two-player, asymmetric, trick-taking game, which that in and of itself, I was like, okay, tell me more. Right. Because I love games like Fox in the Forest and Claim, which are basically the only other two two-player trick-taking games that I know of. Odin's, you can play Odin's, Odin's Ravens? Oh, I do. That's I, a good one. I, is that trick-taking? Uh, not really. It's card game. Though. Yeah, it is a two-player card game. But um, in this game... One player's playing Dr. Jekyll, the other one's playing Mr. Hyde. And you're going to play three rounds, and each round is ten tricks. Mm. If you're playing Dr. Jekyll, each round you want to win as many as you lose. Mm. So you want to balance. So talking about theme, right. I thought the theme of this That's was awesome. super cool. So Dr. Jekyll wanted Dr. Jekyll wanted to maintain a balance of his personality, which is what he wants to do. So you want to win five tricks and lose five tricks. Hyde. He either wants to win as many as he can or lose as many as he can. Oh, interesting. interesting. And you get to choose? or Well, each player of the two, gotcha. someone's Jekyll and someone's Hyde. And then you can play again and swap. Gotcha. But for the three rounds, you maintain your role. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, as Hyde wins, so let's say I won three and you won mm -hmm. seven tricks. If I was Hyde, there's a marker that will move three spaces towards Hyde's side of mm. the personality. If after three rounds, or if before three rounds, Hyde gets to the end of that track, Hyde wins. If at the end of three rounds, it's not there, Jekyll wins. He's maintained That's balance. That's nice. That's cool. Gotcha. And there's, I, I, I could go on and on. There's this <laughs> really cool way. There's these three chips that come into play because there's, there's three suits, one to seven, and Trump will cycle. And there's potions, and you play a potion, and you can change Trump. Mm -hmm. It is a really really cool game they're sending us a copy so as soon as we get it we'll try to get some sort of content up so you guys can see it but it's coming out i think in the next month or two um two-player asymmetric jekyll versus hyde so that's awesome also on bga by the way nice yeah, yeah. too bad we didn't have that for a halloween stream we could have i know i really would have loved it for the halloween stream did either of you have another game did you want to talk any more about arc nova or Boom no Light? i mean only because we have videos up already i'd rather you guys went and watched our videos <laughs> we have a round one that we did on boon lake and we're, we have a kind of a first impressions video of arc nova coming soon um i will say 
you know, kind of these games that come out that we love and then we just kind of forget about. We had a Halloween party over the last weekend and we played the game Medium for like an hour and a half. Did you? And I forget, I forget how much fun that game is. Like, it's easy to just leave Medium sitting on the shelf. Like, I, it brought me back to the first time I ever played Medium. We had such a good experience playing that. I don't know why I just forget it how is much a I great, love it. If you're having a party, you should always get it out. It's just yeah. like Just One. I was going to say we played Just One, too. Yeah, we played Just One at the Halloween party and had a blast with it. And mm-hmm. it's one of those games where like, we're just not around a big group enough to where Medium and That's Just true. One come what, out. What happened to big groups? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, one other game that we played uh, was Time Bomb. I was going to say Time Bomb. Um, what you had... Well, you'd played Don't Mess With Cthulhu with us once yes. b- before, but mm-hmm. that was your first exposure to that whole concept, right? Right, Don't correct. Mess? So what did you think about Time Bomb and how it changed things up a little bit? I like Time Bomb. So we played it the first round with just the simple rules where like that one yeah. bomb does one simple effect, right? And I thought that was good. I thought that was a good way to get us into it. The second time we played it, we were all the bombs with the full rules, right? All the bombs do different effects. Um, and at first, when you read it off, I was like, this is too much already. <laughs> I'm not going to remember what It did seem like are. a lot. But I think when we, once we were playing it and we were into it, uh, the icon helped a lot yeah. for you to remember what it was. And once you started getting going, you really remembered what they were. Um, I also think it helped to then remember which colors, because the thing about the game is that you're, you are either trying to find check marks, so you're diffusing bombs, or you find bombs and they do bad things. But it's not just bombs, it's different colored bombs, right? So if you ever get to like six blue bombs, you'll lose, or six green bombs. And sometimes you're yeah. looking at your cards and you think, okay, I just need to know how many bombs, how many checks. Um, but that's not true. You really need to know how many check marks and how many of each color bomb you have so that later in the round, if that becomes relevant, you can tell people I had a pink, a red, an orange, and a check mark. Um, and at first, to remember that, the first it, round, it just really be a lot. was. And we were at a party, and there were some adult beverages going I'm on. Sure. I know that <laughs> that affected my abilities, but um, it is definitely. You haven't played it, right? I haven't. It is a much thinkier version of Don't Mess with Cthulhu, and of course, Don't Mess with Cthulhu was based on Time Bomb, mm-hmm. but this is sort of a enhanced version. I think it's called Time Bomb Evolution. It's from Yellow, um, and Ryan, yeah, you got to try it. It yeah, is I mean, definitely I, a thinkier it's version. It's hard to beat Don't Mess with Cthulhu. That game is so good. It, I think you'd like this one though too. Yeah, it's 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 if it's just like Don't Mess with Cthulhu, but in Don't Mess with Cthulhu, there are cards that are effectively nothing, right. and neutral. Every card in this is something. Yeah. Like she said, it's either a bomb of a certain color or it's a check mark. So everything Every happens. Every piece of information. And there's no one card that just ends the game. Right. You have to kind of slowly get to six of those certain well, colored let's bombs. Let's play it. Let's do it. All right. The only yeah. other game I was going to talk about, too, because we did it at Halloween and I thought it was thematic, was we played Betrayal at the House of the Hill. Um, oh, I watched you play some of that. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I, I love play, that game. We played Betrayal Legacy, played and Betrayal I Legacy. can't believe you're still ready for more Betrayal after well, that. I don't Halloween. know if she is after this experience. Yeah. Well, the, okay, so the haunt we got, I don't know if anyone else has ever played this one. It's I forget what it was called, but it's about mannequins. They went all through the house. Like, there were monster tokens on literally every room in the house. And so if you've ever played Betrayal, you know that's kind of intimidating. Yeah. Um, it wasn't my favorite haunt by any means, um, but I do still think it was fun to play it on Halloween and get some kind of like haunted house vibes going yeah, and sure. some like just a little minor role playing. Um, but yeah, it was not my favorite haunt, but that's what we told the folks who were playing with us too. It's it's a good like gateway into the games, um, but don't, I would not redo that one haunt. But the yeah. best thing about Betrayal is that there's so many. You yeah, know? I mean, there's a You're never going to get the second one. There's a huge book of haunts and an expansion that has even more yeah. haunts. So I have all yeah, of that. There was, I, w- I watched that game being played at times. There was fun being had. And then at a certain point, I think <laughs> I'm there was less there fun was being turn. had. You, you could tell when it turned. There was, there was a time well, where everyone at the table the looked like they were like, I think we'd be okay going on to a different game <laughs> now. Yeah. Uh, so that is our conversation about what we've been playing. I think we did a great job of working in theme, even with the game. That's true. Go. We did, actually. Very good. Halloween helps that. It yeah. does. It really um, does. So make sure and comment below. Tell us anything you feel about themes, games you've been playing with heavy themes, mm-hmm. or whether or not you think you know themes are going in the direction we all talked about them going. Until next time, though, make sure everyone has fun at the table, and we'll see you then. It's all fine. David's like, I want an easy editing job. Brian's like, here's what I got for you. Here's what I'm bringing to the table. It's like Pond pond Stars. I can offer you this. Here's what I'm looking for.
<laughs> Here's what I'm offering. Exactly. <laughs> um, I got some coughs. <laughs> I'll lose my train of thought. No, that's the And times. if you're lucky, I might cough and lose my train of thought. <laughs> I don't know. I, I got. I just lost the word, but I got it. Okay. <laughs>